Students often have a hard time with um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia only because they haven't spent enough time with uh, dealing with the immunology of a couple of these immunoglobulins that we'll take a look at. So let's once and for all bring absolute clarity to autoimmune hemolytic anemia. To begin with, immune hemolytic anemia, same thing. What's going to end up happening here is that with IMA, immune hemolytic anemia, well, there are two different types that we'll take a look at. Agglutination of RBCs in cold types is, uh, well, by looking at this picture, rather difficult for you to figure out immediately. However, with enough history, say the patient is uh, suffering from uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, and then we will talk more about how the patient is developing cold. So when we do immune hemolytic anemia, or autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there are two types. One will be warm, the other will be cold. And apart from that, most importantly, you need to figure out as to how to differentiate between the two, its associations. Last time we even brought up anything in dealing with immune hemolytic anemia was actually a differential hereditary spherocytosis. Do you remember that? Why did I bring anything up there? Well, do you remember what a hereditary spherocytic type of RBC looks like? A spherocyte. Do you remember the differential that I had given you? Good. Warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which we haven't looked at yet, yet but we shall. And uh, in hereditary spherocytosis, what was the test that we conducted in which it ruled out warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Good. Coombs test. Coombs test is negative, hereditary spherocytosis. Coombs test is positive, you're looking in the realm of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and that'd be more warm though. Let's begin at the top. Let's take a look at the protocol for direct Coombs test. Now, the Coombs test is indirect and direct. I'll give you the indications as to when you'd want to conduct which type. And I'm briefly just going to un uh, identify or kind of look at the steps of some of these Coombs tests. So let's say you have an RBC with a IgG antibody. And right off the back, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, well, we have um, a state called Georgia. And... Uh, well, for the most part, the state of Georgia tends to be remain warm, but whatever. Let's go with stereotypes and generalities, please. So it's warm in Georgia. The G in IgG, if you wish to use, is warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Is that clear? You need to find a way in which you differentiate the warm and cold. I'm going to keep reinforcing this so that you know as to what type we're dealing with. Warm is only dealing with IgG. So here you have an RBC in your patient that is stuck with IgG. How? We'll come to that later. What are we going to do? We're going to then identify the pathologic complex. This is in the patient, this complex right here. So what are we going to use? We're going to use an anti-IgG antibody. That's the Coombs reagent. Make sure you're familiar with this. So what is it going to do, do you think? If you use an anti-IgG antibody, it's going to attack, or not so much attack, but really bind the IgGs. What do you end up forming? A positive direct Coombs test. What have you identified with this test? Oh, I've identified an, an well, quote-unquote antigen, which is the RBC in this case, or uh, viewed as such by the body. And the antibody, which is which one here? IgG. And what type would that be for you? Warm or cold? Warm. I haven't given you any associations. I haven't given you any causes. But what I have given to you at this point is the protocol that's quick and easy for you to understand the direct Coombs test. Direct. Now, looking for antibody and or C3 on surface of patient's RBC is your objective if you take a look at the bottom of this page. So what about the indirect? How do you use this? Now, this one, we're not going to use so much with our autoimmune hemolytic anemia. However, this is an important test. Well, I, as I said, I'll give you the indications, and I'm not going to go through all of immunology. However, I'll give you the basics. Step one, you add test blood group, let's say O. What's O mean to you? Universal donor, right? And the reason it's universal donor is because, the, as you know, the O type RBC refers to the fact there's no antigens on the membrane of that RBC. Do you remember that from immunology? 
<laughs> so if there's no antigens on that RBC membrane, it's very easy for you to all donate your RBC to the recipient that requires a transfusion. But this is the problem, right? Is the O-type RBC able to receive any blood? No. So it's not a universal recipient because the O-type blood person, individual, has antibodies for both A and B. So therefore, cannot accept any A-type RBC because, oh my goodness, you'll have a transfusion reaction and the patient is going to die. Transfusion reaction. Why? Because the O-type has antibody attacking the A RBC from the donor, but then also has B antibodies. So if I'm the O-type uh, RBC patient and I'm receiving B-type blood, my antibody is going to then attack the B-type RBC. Can't have that either. That's a transfusion reaction. But can I give? Yes. Universal donor. I'm extremely generous. But all I do is give, 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 give but I never receive anything back. Does that sound like your relationship? That's a topic for another day. But anyhow, add test blood type O, RBC to test tube to bind to what? The IgG antibody. So now what happens? There you go. At this point, you have now created some type of coding of your IgG. Next, what are you going to do? You're going to do step two, which is adding that Coombs reagent, which is what, what again? It's an anti-IgG antibody. Yeah, I have it, agglutination. But then, so Dr. Raj, this doesn't look any different from the direct. Well, it's completely different. I want you to go back to that first step there. Do you see those ORBCs there? Those are not from the patient. Go back and compare this to direct. In direct, those RBCs were from the patient that already had a pre-existing IgG to it. Is that clear? And then what you end up doing is you get these IgG antibodies and then they will bind to the O-type test RBCs. So this is the one that you may want to spend a little bit more time with so that your step here, what are you looking for? You're looking for the antibody in the patient's serum. That's what indirect does. Indirect is going to then identify your antibodies. Therefore, indirect Coombs test is a, read the top, antibody screen. This is not what we're going to use in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Why might you ask? Because in the previous discussion of direct in autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we're going to find IgG already bound to the RBC. And that's what's in the patient. And what we're going to do is then confirm that there is such a complex taking place and we'll find agglutination. If you're still unclear about this, well, it's okay. For now, you fully understand direct, and you keep coming back to this explanation for indirect, and trust me, you'll get it. You'll get it. Let's continue. Okay, so here are my indications for direct and indirect. Close your eyes and tell me about direct. What are you trying to identify? The antibody? Is it an antibody screen? Or are you trying to identify the antigen-antibody complex? Good. You're trying to, in this case, we're trying to identify the RBC, which has now been attacked or bound pathologically with an IgG. That's the complex we're trying to identify. Let's continue. You incubate the patient RBCs with anti-IgG or IgM. What are those? The Coombs reagent. Tell me about this RBC. Is it a test RBC or is it the patient's RBC? Look, read, patient RBC. That already has the IgG bound to it or IgM bound to it. Are we clear? Next. With this Coombs reagent, guess what it binds to? Good. It binds to the IgG because the Coombs reagent is your anti-IgG. If you get positive and it's for IgG, it's warm. If you want to use warm in Georgia, by all means, please do so. Or IgM, it's cold in Michigan, especially during winter months. So whatever that helps you Memorize and always associate IgG, warm, IgM, cold. That's, for, that's step one. Quickly, I'm just going to give you indirect. That is really, this, is, this test is not relevant for us in this lecture series, but it is important overall in medicine. An in, in indirect Coombs test, what are you trying to identify? Good. The antibody. That's why it's called an antibody screen. Whom 
Who's your population that you're truly worried about finding antibody? How about maternal prenatal testing? What do you mean? You all have heard of RH incompatibility, right? RH incompatibility. What goes on with that? Well, it's the fact that you have a mother who is RH negative and the fetus is RH positive. The firstborn, no problem, gets out. However, the problem is that the mother who was RH negative, what RH negative mean to you? It means on the RBC membrane, you have antigens. If your mother does not have a D antigen, then she is RH negative. What about the fetus? She's holding on to a fetus. The fetus on the fetus's RBC membrane, there might be a D antigen. What do you call the fetus at that point? Good, RH positive. Now, the firstborn will be okay if even if she's not getting any treatment, right? The reason for that is because it takes time for the mother to, to develop antibodies. Not to mention, even if you had IgM from the mother, is IgM going to cross the placental barrier? Not at all. So the firstborn gets out, but the mother, she forms what? F- preformed antibody. When we say preformed antibody, what does that mean? IgG. Uh-oh. Now she gets pregnant again. She doesn't have proper access to health care or, for whatever reason, she chooses not to get prenatal care. So now, she's still RH negative. She hasn't changed. But what about the fetus? The fetus, the second one as well, is also RH positive. Whew. This fetus really has no chance of living if she doesn't get care. So what happens to that preform? What kind of preform antibodies does a mother have? IgG. What's IgG do? Whoop! Passes right through the placental barrier, huh? And the mother then sees the fetus. Unfortunately, the the maternal immune system views the fetus as being the enemy, the antigen. It's not supposed to be there. And so, therefore, the maternal IgG, unfortunately, will kill the fetus. How? Carnectoris. That's something that you have discussed immunology. I'm just quickly repeating this. Isn't it imperative? that you do an antibody screen where you can see as to whether or not the RH negative mother has the antibody that might kill off the fetus. Sure, indirect maternal prenatal testing prior to blood transfusion is big. Detects unbound anti-RBC antibody. Big point, unbound, because this is an antibody screen. Patient serum is incubated with RBCs of known antigenicity. That is not the RBC from the patient. Compare that to the RBC in the direct. That's the RBC from the patient. If you do have agglutination, then you have positive here. But as I said, for our discussion in this lecture series, there's some very important points under indirect Coombs, but we will be focusing upon direct Coombs test and how that's relevant for us to diagnose autoimmune hemolytic anemia. We'll talk about warm first. This is the one that has clinical, clinical significance. Most cases are idiopathic. However, there's some important, important associations. SLE, CLL, and drugs. Take a look at these diseases. SLE is no joke. Autoimmune destruction, malar rash, maybe SLE-induced kidney damage, heart damage, all kinds of issues, huh? What about CLL? One of the most common leukemias that we have in our society is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Occurs in older patients. And this is the patient that has uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of WBCs. Massive leukemia taking place, right, in this patient. These are no joke type of diseases. So these, in, these patients who may have anemia oftentimes will have the warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Would you please tell me one more time what kind of immunoglobin you're looking for in warm? Where is it warm, quote, unquote? Good. IgG. We will... In this lecture series, go through in great detail penicillin and how methyl dopa is going to then cause warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That is important. That, at this point, I wish to introduce. And at some point, by the time we're done with the lecture series, you need to make sure that you walk away having this permanently memorized in your head. You'll see why. You'll see why. So what is warm? Warm means uh, 37 degrees Celsius. Warm reacting, IgG, autoantibodies formed against RBC surface antigen, IgG, warm. 
the coded antibodies. Now you pay attention. Do you remember that discussion that we had early on with the overview of normocytic hemolytic anemias? And during that discussion, we talked about the spleen, and we talked about how the splenic macrophages were the guests. And the guests there were having dessert, quote-unquote. And it was the fact that maybe a strawberry is good, but what makes it better? You dip it into chocolate, and it's coated, right? When you coat something with, well, really sweet, whatever, my ingredient, then you're making that substance very, very attractive for Manj, meaning phagocytosis. What is this chocolate that you're going to coat the RBC with? IgG. It's an opsonin. So now IgG, warm type, you've made that RBC really, really attractive for whom? The splenic macrophages that are hungry. So if the, if the RBC gets killed off prematurely by the spleen, what kind of hemolysis is this? Good. Extra vascular hemolysis. Are we clear? How is the patient going to present? Significant jaundice or hemoglobinuria? Significant jaundice. I'm going to give you a piece of information that's really current with IgM when we get to it. And you're going to like it because it's a lot of integration. Things you already know, it'll make perfect sense. Let's take a look at warm. Dr. Raj, I've seen that picture before. <laughs> Very good. Nice. That picture we saw with hereditary spherocytosis. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, interchangeable these are. Okay? So, in hereditary spherocytosis, what were you focusing upon in this picture? The spherocyte. So, therefore, technically speaking, you can use this and the board's will. This picture is interchangeable with hereditary spherocytosis or warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. They're that close in... Uh, in uh, Imaging? Yeah, they are. They really are. So how can you tell the difference? These will be direct Coombs test positive. What are you going to find? IgG coating these RBCs. There's no, obviously, you know, you can't see the IgG coating the RBC. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're Superman, whatever. <laughs> that's, your, that's your issue, but I'm not. Most people aren't. So here, you can't see the IgG on the membrane. So if microspherocyte but this is not hereditary spherocytosis, generated with splenic macrophage removes parts of the antibody-coated membrane. Clear. What's that antibody coating here? Warm. IgG. One more time. Good. Nearly impossible to differentiate with whom? There it is. Hereditary spherocytosis. What's the test again? Direct Coombs test. If you missed this question, I will find a way to track you down and slap you across the face. There's so many different times that I've told you about the differential. Do not forget these differentials. I'm giving, this, I'm giving these to you on purpose so that you don't confuse them on your exam. Okay, and I say that with utmost care or uh, compassion. Warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, clinical features, signs of symptom of anemia. What does that mean? Especially hemolytic. Sure, fatigue and tiredness, anemia. In addition, what else are you gonna find with warm? What kind of hemolysis? extravascular, so therefore jaundice and maybe pigment stones. What kind of test? Direct Coombs test. What is it going to identify? Good. An antibody bound to an RBC. That complex. What's this called that you use to bring about agglutination? Coombs reagent. There it is. The anti-IgG immunoglobulin. What temperature might you want to use this at? At least 37 degrees Celsius. Why? Warm. If the cells agglutinate, this indicates the presence of IgG coating the RBC membrane. Do you see how easy it is once you lay it on the foundation? So everything that we do here, absolute clinical significance, but, uh, you know, we have to have a discussion first so that all this comes to light. So for transfusions, all blood will have a positive cross-match, so they are then labeled as being incompatible. So be careful. So you don't want to have transfusions in which it's coated with IgG. So it comes back to be positive. Be careful. Just keep that in mind. Something that you want to do here uh, when you're dealing with, especially indirect type of Coombs test. Let's go on to cold now. With cold, well, first and foremost, take a look at an association. The big one here will be mycoplasma and pneumonia. Before I move on, you have to tell me who this patient is, right? So this is a patient that has low-grade fever, walking. Everything's great, doc. I'm having a wonderful day today. Sure. 
No bed rest at all. I'm good. You do a chest x-ray. Oh, oh wow. That looks rather dangerous. It makes me kind of uh, worried. Why? Well, it's because this is a chest x-ray in which you got scared because you saw the interstitium showing you what kind of pattern on chest x-ray with mycoplasma. A reticular pattern, wasn't it? A reticular nodule pattern. And so therefore, the chest x-ray might look worse than the actual condition. So your patient was walking around, low-grade fever. What is this? Atypical pneumonia. That's your patient. And if your patient with mycoplasma pneumonia is presenting with, well, anemia, and this is what it would be, cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So what is cold? Well, as I told you, if you want to use cold in Michigan, by all means, please do so. But you here, you'll find IgM antibodies. Next, what about these autoantibodies? Well, these will then bind to in cold extremities. That's important. Antibody bind causes complement fixation. Stop here. Why? Complement fixation is a big deal. Really? I was just going to read through this, Dr. Raj. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so complement fixation means that, you tell me, there are three major pathways for complement, right? One is the classic, one is the alternative, the other one is lectin. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the classical. What's a classical complement pathway? Why do we call it classic? Because it's the antigen antibody, antigen antibody, antigen antibody complex that will stimulate the classical pathway. Why do I keep repeating antibody? Guess what that antibody is that starts off the classic complement pathway? Think. Oh, it's the IgM. Yep. What does an IgM look like? It's fat. What do you mean? It's a pentamer. It has five arms. It's a really fat immunoglobulin. In other words, it's huge, huge. So the characteristics of a very big immunoglobulin, along with that it's bound to an antigen, no doubt you're going to kick off the classic complement pathway. Keep that in mind. That becomes a really important point for us. Why? Well, then here, here what you're looking at is if you start off the classic complement pathway, you're going to rip through your complements. Here they come, C1, your, your C3 convertase, and you form lots of C3B, C3B, C3B excessively. In your medical education, you may or may not have been taught properly. Pay attention here. Used to be thought that with IgM, that it would then be an intravascular hemolysis because of a complement fixation. Not the case anymore. So current day understanding is the fact that you're going to produce, and this is true, tons of C3B. That C3B is exactly like whom? IgG. What was IgG? Anopsinin, the chocolate around the RBC. And uh, whenever that you bathe your RBC, and chocolate, or in this case, an opsinin, where is the RBC being destroyed? Extravascular hemolysis. Is that clear? So cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia is also going to be part of your extravascular hemolysis because of rapid activation of your classic complement pathway leading into C3B production, opsinization, extravascular hemolysis. That is a big deal. Let's move on. Let's go ahead and take a look at how to diagnose your cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Keep in mind, once again, that we're dealing with the IgM antibody. Here, once again, it's the fact that we're trying to look for RBCs that are coated with the immunoglobulin. So, generally speaking, when you're looking for a complex, you tell me what kind of uh, Coombs test you would want to conduct. Good. A direct Coombs test. Here, since it is cold, a diagnosis is made by identifying cold reactant antibodies but direct Coombs test. The cold autoantibody are fairly common and transient. Think about uh, the condition that we talked about earlier. We have M, IgM, M, atypical pneumonia, the most common cause of atypical pneumonia being mycoplasma pneumonia. So here, as far as clinical significance and severity, well, warm was a lot worse. SLE, CLL, drugs with cold, it will be IgM, mycoplasma pneumonia, and uncommon for them to cause serious clinical consequences. 
So now what we'll do is we'll walk through some of these important drugs that you want to know that bring about either cold or warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Let's begin with penicillin. In pharmacology, you've heard of penicillin binding proteins. Well, the penicillin binding proteins are in the membrane, and at some point in certain populations, this penicillin might then alter what that green circle is, is the RBC. What that P stands for is a penicillin binding protein in which in the membrane it gets altered. So therefore now the RBC is looked at as being an antigen. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to attract IgG. Okay, what does IgG mean to you? Warm or cold? Warm. What does IgG mean to you in terms of hypersensitivity? It is a type 2 hypersensitivity. Once again, what does IgG to the, do to that RBC? It coats it. What is that RBC going to look like and where is it going to go? It'll go to the spleen, undergo extra vascomolysis on your peripheral blood smear, and that RBC will look like a spherocyte, won't it? And what about your Coombs test? Which one are you going to use? Direct or indirect? You're looking for an RBC bound in IgG. I'm hoping now at this point you can correctly answer and say and tell me that it's direct. Good. Take a look at the description here. Type 2 hypersensitivity, antibody-dependent ciliary cell toxicity, and extra vascomolysis. Therefore, tell me about the uh, symptoms. Significant jaundice and pigment stones. Let us now move on to quinidine. Now, quinidine is going to be one of your prototypes of what's known as your class 1 antiarrhythmics, isn't it? So you have quinidine here that the patient's taking because of arrhythmia and wants to block off the sodium channel. Unfortunately, the quinidine has an interesting effect in which it then brings about what's known as an immune complex deposition versus a type 2 hypersensitivity with IgG. IgM, you're going to form an immune complex, and that will then deposit on RBC due to quinidine. Huh, amazing. So what kind of hypersensitivity is this? This would be a type 3 hypersensitivity, and the big change of understanding now is the fact that if you have a type of cold IgM, then that IgM will trigger your complement, and that complement pathway leads to C3B production, and hence extravascomolysis, opsonization. Those of you that have learned it being intervascular and such, well, be very careful, because it's really not the case anymore clinically. Methyl dopa is what we're looking at next. Please pay attention here. This is an important clinical scenario. With methyl dopa, who is your patient? Well, my patient is pregnant, and she has blood pressure of 160 over 90, first trimester. Okay. So you want to try to tackle this hypertension, obviously. I gave you first trimester because I don't want there to be any confusion with preeclampsia here. Okay. So anyhow, you're trying to treat the hypertension of a pregnant lady. She, was, she had predisposing hypertension already. She was already taking ACE inhibitor for her hypertension. She became pregnant. Oh my goodness, please remove her off of the ACE inhibitor. Or otherwise, the ACE inhibitor will kill the fetal kidneys, as you know. The teratogen. But you still have to absolutely take care of that hypertension, because if you don't, then you increase the risk of something like placenta abrupto, abrupto placenta, right? Later on down the road. So here, you give something called an alpha-2 agonist, centrally acting. Hmm. So this is alpha methyl dopa. So by stimulating your alpha-2 receptors up in the brain, what have you done? Alpha-2 receptors are located where? On the presynaptic terminal, isn't it? On the presynaptic terminal, you inhibit the release of your norepinephrine, and therefore you try to control that hypertension. It's safe from pregnancy. Know that. In certain populations, this methyl dopa is, what does RH mean again? It's a D antigen. This methyl dopa in certain populations is going to configure, or should I really disfigure, the RH antigen in the membrane to the point where the RBC becomes absolutely unrecognizable or recognized as an antigen. Guess who's going to come in? IgG. So what's IgG? A warm. What is IgG? An opsonin. Where does it go? To the spleen. Extra vascomolysis, type 2 sensitivity. Do you see as to how the drugs bring about interesting autoimmune hemolytic anemias, I've given you three big ones. Penicillin, methodopa, IgG, warm, type 2 sensitivity. Quinidine, IgM, immune complex. We have all of these really 
have an extravascular type of picture. Take a look at malaria. So finally, we're done with autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And uh, this is our last little example of what we need to take a look at here with anemias with extrinsic problem. So your patient has now been exposed to whatever type of mosquito and the type of uh, Anopheles mosquito and the type of protozoa that you're looking for here is going to be, of course, your plasmodium, isn't it? You have different types. I'm not going to go through the microbiology. That's a different conversation. But quotidian variable, falciparum, tertian, vivax, every 48 hours, quartan, malaria, every 72 hours. Okay, so uh, falciparum being the most lethal of them all. And then uh, the one that's uh, extremely common would be the vivax, right, vivax. And lucky, luckily enough, with vivax, it's interesting because do you remember what plasmodium vivax loves to bind to on your, on your RBCs? It's called a Duffy antigen, right, Duffy. There's another antigen for you, Duffy, crazy. So if your patient is rendered Duffy negative, <laughs> and she, then he or she is completely resistant to the most common type of malaria, the vivax. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Now, what we're looking at here in this picture is going to be those RBCs, especially the one that you see in the, in the middle there, uh, to the uh, little, little up to the left there, and that's one that has plasmodium species in it, ring forms. And so therefore, uh, what this means is that every time these RBCs come into the circulation, well, maybe you've seen the movie Alien, and in there, the alien then bursts through the stomach, right? That's what the plasmodium does. It'll burst through the RBC membrane. And every time it comes out is the fever. So depending as to when it wishes to literally rear its ugly head is when the patient is going to feel his or her fever. Welcome to malaria. That's crazy. But that's exactly how it works. You tell me as to what kind of anemia this is. It's a normocytic, hemolytic, intravascular type of anemia. It's that simple. What kind of, uh, what kind of symptoms is the patient going to have apart from the fever and such and that uh, pattern that you need to know oh so well for malaria? Well, hemoglobinuria, right, in terms of its anemia. Vivax being the most common every 48 hours. Falciparum being the most lethal. Quartan malaria, 72 hours. 